Hey everybody. Happy Monday to you all. Thanks for joining us. Has everyone uh, eaten pie today and yesterday? Today's the leftovers, right? Alyssa, you should do a, a pie thing for pie day like you do for your hot chocolate. Yes, great idea. You could, you could hit up all these different pie places. Right, reviews, mm -hmm. monetize. Yeah, there you go, right? <laughs> and then and then you can then you can survey or review like diabetes doctors. Yeah. <laughs> Educational at the same time. Right. <laughs> I think I think that would be a fun way to go. Those are awesome though. I we we loved watching those. Those are great. And they're very informative. We totally watched them and, and we would totally follow you to some of those places. Oh, but, awesome. But if you didn't like it, we wouldn't go. Like it was you have power, you don't realize. Thank you. Yes, I am an influencer. Yeah, in its true yes. definition. Right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, welcome everyone. We're going to get started uh, here and uh, I'm going to introduce to you uh, Dr. Adam Johnson. Of course, uh, we're thrilled. This is our second session with Adam uh, during this um, this project of, of our SCORE studies and having a world-class professional orchestra conductor look at our band music and tell us what he sees and what what they uh how they would approach it and um the first session of course was on samuel hazel's ride and it was fantastic and today we are focusing on david holsinger's on his hymn song philip bliss which is another standard piece of repertoire for junior high and and even high school a uh, beautiful piece of music and so i'd like to welcome and thank adam for joining us all the way from montreal um where he's busily preparing he was just telling me before this he's preparing for a uh, a concert with the Montreal Symphony in just a few weeks. So hopefully if it's streaming, we can all tune in and be your fans on there. That would be pretty fun. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it's it's exciting to have, uh, have some concerts happening again. So good evening, everyone. And it's a pleasure to be here with you and, uh, and a pleasure to explore some really beautiful music. When I first was looking at this uh, hymn song of Philip Bliss, I read the little preamble and uh, there's kind of double double tragedy to, that seems to have led to this uh, composition that the um, the person who wrote the the hymn having lost four daughters and then the also the uh, well the poems rather the poem having lost his four daughters and then the person who set it to music having died in a train wreck um, and then this kind of being a tribute to, to them it's uh, now, I don't think that that tragedy is so much in the music because it is a song of hope. Um, but uh, but still, it's something that, um, that can be good for students to know. And certainly whenever I'm studying a piece of music, I definitely go into the, the history of it because um, it can inform what we're doing with the performance. So I've got a uh, camera so here. Studying a piece of music, I going to share this all right so can you see that uh can you see the score all right yeah there we go all right um again it's a little darker than i intended but we can work with that i think um all right so now when uh when i'm diving into a piece of music i, I tend to look at the structure of things first uh, I won't go through a, like a, an individual structural analysis. Um, I'll kind of talk about each bit as we go. No. Um, but well, I, I do just as a thing, I do tend to mark my four bar phrases with a line. Um, the reason I do that is so that I don't have to look down at the score much when I'm conducting. Um, I can look and quickly see a four bar section and I know where I am within it and my eyes can be out and then I, I try to have my eyes out of the score as much as I possibly can. But then by having these, uh, these lines marked, I can quickly see the sections. And uh, when I just glance down to check something, I, I kind of can find where I am quickly. So I'm sure you all have your various tricks and whatever for, for things like that, but that's just uh, a way that, uh, that I do it. Now, when in this introduction section here, we've got this little eight bars. 
I then noted, was looking for, well, what are our pairings? Because I'm going to need to know who I've got to be tuning, right, with our, um, with our unison instruments. And so another way I've marked this here is just I've marked, well, we've got the, uh, the alto sax, we've got our first clarinet, and I just kind of did a little line there. And then we've got these three instruments here that the second and third clarinet, well, three groups, um, and the second alto sax. And now with these people, what we're going to be trying to build is a very seamless type of fabric where uh, one group of instruments plays and passes it beautifully into the next group of instruments. So this is a really wonderful exercise for getting uh, for people to listen to each other and to hear the level uh, that each group is finishing off with and that the next group can continue on with because we've got kind of a long crescendo going towards our fourth bar here. Um, and so when we do, uh, let me just see, what is this? Uh, clarinet and F or B flat. Okay, so. So with fa, mi, fa, so, la. That we want this to sound as much as possible like like a, you know it being passed from one group to the next. Now, one thing is this is another great opportunity to teach some advanced music making. I, I find slow music is actually far trickier musically, right, than uh, fast music where it just tears along. Here we really, I mean, intonation is always much trickier, um, but also for phrasing, the sustaining and things. This is an awesome piece for teaching to phrase across bar lines, right? That uh, it's already kind of marked in here for us, but we really want to feel this. To be leading us across bar lines and that the, the first clarinets and the alto saxophones are kind of driving the music forward into the next bar. So we've got this beautiful right and then and then i'm just reading here and then when we get down to we have to continue the crescendo all the way to this downbeat of our fourth bar okay so one thing that often happens with students and it can happen at the professional level too is that you see the start of a dynamic change like a decrescendo in this case and people start to anticipate it before you arrive at the downbeat right um whereas it's just telling us from here we're going to start going down but it, it be, but really we want to make sure that we've continued the crescendo into this downbeat because there's this really beautiful dissonance here um with the B flat and the A flat. So for that uh, appoggiatura here to really take effect, well, we wanna make sure that we haven't started the diminuendo too soon because it'll kind of uh, take away some of the uh, musical tension there. And I would also suggest that if you really wanna take the musicianship to another level, to still be really expressive on this first quarter note. Um, you could even put a tenuto mark over it, um, something like this, so that it sings, so that we really have la, sa, fa. Okay, because what happens when there's a decrescendo is right away, la, sa, the people can start coming away, but we lose an expressive opportunity there. If it just right away, starts to fade, it still can sing that first note and then start to come away. Um, and um, now, one of the things that is, there's an opportunity here to relax the tempo a little bit as it comes down. Um, and I listened to two recordings of this uh, today, um, and both of them take a fair amount of time coming down, which, you know, is is like a you know a musical thing to do to feel the relax 
relaxation. Um, I wouldn't exaggerate it too much, though. It's just an opportunity to relax, but not a writ, right? The composer didn't write an outright writ there. It is a structural point. Um, but so just to relax a little bit on the third and fourth beat. And what's a nice chance here for our percussionist is to learn how to just listen and be able to place this little ding of the triangle with a fourth beat that's going to be slightly relaxed. It's going to be just slightly later than where it would normally arrive. So if, he's just, if, the, if the triangle player is counting along, well, he's going to have to listen to and place right with where would that where would the right moment be in order to place with the rest of the ensemble. Um, so then, of course, as the conductor going through this, this is something where I think the way I would conduct this is a lot of horizontal motion in order to encourage movement in the air and movement in the phrasing um, and to encourage some, now it's legato as well, of course, um, but to encourage some forward motion. If we're going to relax a little bit at the end of these four bars, well, it would be good to move it forward a little bit as well in order to arrive at this point. Um, so I would think of it as kind of a, like a and then show them to move across the bar line and then across the bar line encourage the motion across the bar line you get your crescendo and then let the the last bar come down a little bit and eye contact with the triangle player so that he's listening or he or she is listening right and this is just something where it can help them to feel more secure but with just a little bit of eye contact while everybody is feeling the, the slowing down together. And so by just giving a little bit of direction, a little bit of movement forward, a cello rondo is too strong of a term, but I think just with the music rising and with the crescendo rising, it's normal to let it move forward ever so slightly and then to let it relax a bit. And then as we get into the fifth bar, we're joined by the tenor sax and the triangle will be playing uh, now on every fourth beat. Another opportunity to move forward a little bit and I would crescendo slightly more this time than I did the first time to create, yes, we've got a four bar structure and another four bar structure, but in more advanced music making, we always try to make the largest structure possible. Um, so to join four plus four into a big kind of eight bar thing, meaning don't relax too much here. So we still have some momentum going and then crescendo a little bit more here. And you could relax a little bit more at the end of the eight bars. But if you relax a ton here at the end of bar four, then it becomes very uh, stuck, kind of four bars by four bars in a, in a more pedantic way. And so I would encourage you to think of this in terms of really eight bars um, and to build more towards the eighth. Um, and uh, then we have this beautiful little horn line that's going to come in and join uh, and least start the, the next section and really get one of our main themes going. Now, this is something that uh, we see all the time um, in, well, in most music, honestly, but especially I find in band music uh, is the blanket dynamics. Okay, this is something I'm always referring to. Everybody has mezzo piano, mezzo piano, mezzo piano. Everybody's got mezzo piano. And then we also have solo first horn. Well, generally, if, if a composer writes solo first horn, it's probably meant to be a special feature, is meant to come out a little bit. Um, but there's nothing in the dynamics that really helps us out here. And so I would, if I was conducting this, I would ask them to play at least up to a mezzo forte. Start mezzo piano and kind of come into it, but then crescendo. Um, through this A flat. La, la, sol, fa, fa. Okay, so that it can really sing through and end up above the texture of the rest of the group. Now, the others that have the uh, have these half notes, I would tend to mark this down into a, a more of a piano range a little bit. Just let them know you're, you're just accompanying here while you're holding. I, this technically is a melody as well, but I would say a secondary one. Um, and just something I always say, big fish eat little fish, that these long, bigger notes 
while those are being sustained, it can make it harder to hear what's going on in the eighth notes and make it harder for our horn to really be able to sing above. Okay, so this is something that I would just make sure that accompaniment is accompaniment or these secondary lines are secondary and we can really hear the horn. Um, now, we don't want to ask them to play so quietly that like their sound quality be affected or that it doesn't sing, but it's still, um, when it's just one dynamic through, it does not mean that all instruments play equally. Uh, and of course, I know all of our ensembles have different uh, different numbers of instruments and, and whatever. So, but say in an ideal world where it was a balanced instrumentation, um, a blanket dynamic is just a character rather than a decibel level. And so we want to make sure that each of the layers, um, we make a decision as to what we want to have come through. And then bring bring your students attention to those different layers as well, so that they can hear and adjust, you know, according to which layer they fit in. Um, now, something that I would do for this beautiful horn solo. So, like I said, I would kind of put a crescendo to get us across the bar line and it, it makes for a nice lead in. La, la, and then the melody kind of goes down. So, fa, fa. But I wouldn't let the line drop too soon as the melody goes down to really encourage the player to sing and sustain and to project across these quarter notes that go down. Now, when we get to the next bar, here, I think it could fade away a little bit because it's kind of our first gesture. La, la, sol, fa, fa. It's natural here to breathe, right? And then we can start the next bit of our phrase. Mi, fa, sol, si, la, sol, fa. Right? And so here, I would encourage them to really put shape, put a kind of a curve into this um, so that we've got, uh, what note is that? That's a mi, so mi, fa, sol. I would really think crescendo through this. Mi, fa, sol. And that giving that direction helps us to get over the top of this melody, over the top of that little third, uh, or that third jump that goes up to the B flat. So we have mi, fa, sol, si, la, sol, fa. And it becomes a very organic and singing beautiful melody this way versus thinking of it, a, you know, we want to move away from note by note, which is where we have to start when we're learning it. But then to encourage them to get into the into the shape and into the curve. There is nothing in the music that indicates any di We've just got mezzo piano and then a series of notes. But so we have to as the as the conductor as the interpreter kind of go if we were to sing this how would it be natural how would it be beautiful and i would encourage you to get the students to sing it so that they can you know learn the natural expression of the line and then to try to imitate that when they're playing on their instrument to get the singing tone but then also to get really the phrasing so i would encourage a crescendo through here mi fa sol si la sol fa and they can resolve across the bar line here there's a natural um we've got the, the harmonic progression here um we have a just a four five one cadence so there's a, a natural resolution point here um now in the other lines, in the secondary lines, uh, where who's if these are E flats. By the way, I'm sure you're all very familiar with how to read uh, quickly the you know the different um, the different transpositions. One thing I a trick I typically use when it's an E flat instrument is I just read it in bass clef. Um, but then you have to you have to do the uh, the key signature as well. But anyway, it's a, it's a little shortcut that's pretty handy whenever an instrument's in in E flat. Um, so da, 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 da. Um, ah yeah, we should talk about actually. I was about to talk about the phrasing of this, and I realized I missed the opportunity back here at the beginning. 
Um, since this material will come back lots of times, it's worth to it's worth it to spend lots of time here, and then we won't have to do it at the end. But one thing with this, the phrasing of these eights. Now, there's a couple of ways that you could think about this. The composer has written a long, steady crescendo that goes to our fourth, okay, uh, bar, as we said. Now, you could take this very literally and see this as a continuous build that happens across every eighth note subdivision of the bars as it goes. So you'd have fa, uh, fa, mi, fa, sol, fa, sa, da, da, di, da, and then la, fa, da, di, da, all the way to the la, sol, fa. So what that kind of does is it makes for a like a, just a steady build, but it also flattens it out in a way in that we can't feel when we go from fa, mi, fa, what's the difference of tension in a mi versus the fa? If we've set this up as we're, uh, we're in D flat major, okay? So this is our third. Yada, the E flat, the second degree is naturally has more tension than the third does, right? So to me, there's something that's naturally, there's a bit of uh, that tension there, it's a bit expressive. And I wouldn't want to flatten that out too much. I would want to, personally, I would want to feel that so that means to me that the E flat and the G flat are a little bit more expressive than the F. But then I can still do what the composer is asking in building each one, but each one of these successive motifs builds then. So so you can be expressive within each one and still have the crescendo. And I think that's a more interesting and more beautiful option than just taking literally, you know, like a, a slight decibel increase through each eighth note as the bar goes on. Um, but I mean, you both would be fine. It's just what, whatever you think uh, works. And depending on the level of the players as well and how much expression they're able to, to feel or put in. Um, but this is, I think, a, a moment for, uh, there's some opportunities there for beautiful music making. And, um, and that goes for the, the other, the, the answer line as well in the other, in the first clarinet and the uh, alto sax. There's more tension on the A flat than there is on the B flat. Right, so uh, I think those can, yeah, feel it anyway. It's, it, there's always in music, we've got the microstructure and the macro structure. So the macro structure is what's our long line? What's the, the, the phrase, where is it going? And how do each of those successive phrases join together into a section of a piece? So we, as I said earlier, generally the more advanced the music making, the more we have a sense of the macro structure. We have a sense of how all these phrases are gonna to fit together, like a bird's eye view of the piece. But you also wanna have the micro structure, which is the relationships between the notes. How do they, how do we have relative tension in there? Where does it sing more? Where does it resolve? And these sorts of things. And so to not let one completely obliterate the other, Right and and forget the microstructure in order to just have the long line, but also we don't want to get stuck smelling the flowers on every little note and forget that we also have to phrase across four bars, right? So, um, so ultimately, if you can arrive at being able to do both, well, then that's really some very fine music making, 
right? And that's something as an adjudicator, I would be, you know, looking for and seeing, well, which one did they favor or did they manage to do both? And if they left one of them out, well, it suggests that they, you know, keep, keep what they can do and see if you can add in the extra expressive element or the added structural element in it. Um, so then when we get into back to where I'd left off here in measure nine, um, to just keep singing through these. Now, in this uh, nice line here, um, when we have this long scale going down, again, there's nothing marked in the music in terms of changing expression at all. Um, but what I would do is, uh, so when we have this long scale going down, I would suggest almost like a crescendo towards the second beat of this, okay? I don't literally mark it as a crescendo because it's a bit of a crude way to, to think of it. I think of it as a curve where we feel the... F as we're going around the corner of this line, we kind of feel like in a car when you're going around a corner, you feel the forces push the line around the second beat. And generally we, that would be here. But if you wanted to mark it with crescendo and decrescendo, it would be a little bit like this. So that we would have, we'd have fa mi re do si la sol fa la. And just again, another way to just put a little bit of expression, a little bit of natural shape, that if we were to sing, we wouldn't do each note successively and in, in a rigid way. We'd But the problem with putting a uh, crescendo in there is that it can become a bit exaggerated. Um, so it's just more of an expressive thing rather than, you know, the composer didn't write crescendo decrescendo and he could have, um, but it's just a matter of how to feel this, this long descending line so that it, it has a nice shape to it. All while being underneath the horn, which is a tricky thing because you've got a whole clarinet section and uh, plus the saxes and you've just got this single horn here. Um, then also in the bass line, I mentioned earlier that we've got a 5-1 cadence here. So we've got our A flat, which is resolving onto the uh, D flat. Well, I think with this bass line, so we've got D, E, F, B, We want to naturally feel five, one, okay, to let that resolve a little bit. And so I would definitely be asking players to, you know, who have this thing to make sure that we do a little bit of relaxing here, a little bit of uh, a diminuendo going down um, in order to feel the, the harmonic resolution there, okay? And then the music from here is going to take off again. Um, and we add our flutes in, of course, where they now have a beautiful opportunity to sing. Um, what was there? I think it was fa. Let me just check. Or f. Sorry, I'm so used to to working in um, in French now. When I'm saying fa, is it okay instead of f? Whatever. Okay. Um, it's also easier to sing than singing just a, a letter name. But um, but still, with students, it can be super useful to sing the the note names just to help drill in the the actual you know awareness of what the notes are and so then they've got that and then it's a separate thing from figuring out what the fingerings are but if you can get the musical line in there and know what's the target what are we aiming for well then everything else is to go towards that point you sort of set where's the end point there which is always imitating the human voice anyway and i know uh, getting teens to sing can probably be a challenge at the beginning if they're not used to it. Um, but uh, anyway, it's something that can be worked on and become very natural. So, um, fa, mi, da, da, da. okay, so when the flutes have this, let me get it to here where they, oh no, it's uh, not coming through very clearly here. This says sing. Okay, um, now something I would, it's so weird that it's coming through blurry. Okay, it's the camera that's blurring the edge. Um, there, now I think you can see it, except for I've messed it up now with the thing. But so what I've put in here 
is I would encourage growth across this half note. And to not just go and but to really sustain across the bar. And that means to think of this as a crescendo. Now, I've marked a little tenuto over this sol because if we are in, um, what are we going to be resolving on to here? We have a 6-4. Oh, interesting. I'm just looking at the harmony. Um, we've got a D chord, but it's, it's over an A flat in the bass. Um, but this in, uh, we're heading towards an A flat chord. We've got B flat going to A flat. This is kind of a leading tone, more tension versus the A flat here. Also, when we've got a long crescendo starting, I always look for an opportunity. Whenever I see a crescendo starting, look for an opportunity to start less. Find a way to start quieter because it will allow more room for the crescendo to grow. This is another place where we tend to anticipate. We see the start of a crescendo, so we start louder. <laughs> but it, it means that there isn't as much room for the crescendo. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, you know, a little bit of expressive opportunity lost there. So I would I would feel this uh, this tension here and encourage them to resolve a little bit. And then from that resolution places, then they've got lots of room to be able to do the crescendo. Now this is a very beautiful little thing here. The uh, that the clarinets have. Um, they were B. They were in B flat. I think. If I remember right, yeah. Um, so, da, da, dim. I would, again, with the curve here, I, I would encourage a shape in these three notes going across. Da, da, dim. And I put the line here to say towards the second, towards the middle. You can think of it as a tenuto also, perhaps, but um, di, da, dim. Just more expressive to sing towards the middle of the three groups. Da, da, di, di. Okay. Um, so, whenever there's successive notes, I'm always looking for how do I shape them? Because it's, it's never like a MIDI file where D, 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 right? It's always going to be going somewhere. Crescendo, diminuendo, whatever. Um, but within that growth, there's, there's kind of, I just like to think of it naturally as a, as a curve. Oh, I guess it's faster. This would be, uh, I'm not doing the rhythm right, sorry, but uh, so it'd be and then um, and then another little thing I've marked in here for the alto saxes, they've had this melody going along and they will also have the leading tone along with the flutes. And so I would just encourage them to crescendo a little bit down into this uh, leading tone and to resolve away again so that we have this nice harmonic uh, resolution here, uh, which is going to be, let, well, sort of a res resolution um, that is going to be heading towards this build up here. Now, normally I, I've been talking about when we have a dominant and tonic relationship of 5-1, A flat going into D flat, uh, you would have a resolution, except in this case, we're really going into a new section uh, where the composer is asking for the music to build and to arrive at a new dynamic level. Uh, so this is a place where I would really just continue the crescendo through and arrive in the new dynamic place. Um, now, the horns and trombones are starting a new melody here. So I would encourage a big breath in here and a lot of crescendo expression uh, across our bar line to really make sure that this is an upbeat that leads us into what's happening next. And to not get stuck on this downbeat, but to rather keep singing through. So this is uh, when we have a repeated note here. Keep going through the half note. Re, do, si. Get all the way across the bar line. And then we can resolve a bit on the third quarter and then reshape from the fourth beat. 
Si mi mi re do. And then we've got another opportunity to breathe. Si do re 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 mi fa. There's a, a resolution here again. Um, and there's a crescendo. Well, I typically look, as I said, for an opportunity to start a little bit less. So I've got more room to do uh, the, the crescendo from there. Not in a systematic, predictable way, but just uh, saying, okay, if there's a crescendo, how can we uh, make sure that I've got room to do the growth there? But it just so happens we've got this beautiful A flat to D flat uh, cadence that's very obvious here, 5-1. Um, and so it's nice to, to resolve as we get to the end of this section. Okay, but this, so just another opportunity here for another section to learn some, some excellent shaping, phrasing, keep going across the bar lines and sustain the line as, as long as possible. And in the score, when there was nothing marked here, it was just a half note and then two quarter notes all in a row. But that's not how we would sing. It doesn't tell us how to sing it. And I find it's a shame that um, in these scores, there isn't a little bit more um, there aren't more indications to teach the musicianship. So I would add them in. Um, and just to, to show like we can have the tension here, resolve, and then this fourth beat is actually leading us across the bar line there. So we have, I'll sing it once more. La, re, re, do, si, 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 mi, mi, re, do. And then you see, do you feel how that really joins the line and, uh, and makes it expressive? Uh, versus da, di, 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 right? That just, and that's what's written. You wouldn't be doing anything wrong according to what's written on the score, but music is, the, the, printed music is awful in terms of telling us what the actual music is about. Like it, it, it's just not there. It's like um, if, you, if you have a movie script and you give it to an actor, you're giving them words, right? To, that they're gonna read. But then if they just like stood there and read the words, with none of the meaning or emotion behind it, well, they wouldn't be acting, they would just be reading the words, right? And it's a bit the same, we're given notes, but the notes don't, aren't the music, they're, they're just the sounds, they're, they tell us when uh, and what to play, but the, none of the actual music, uh, the, the expression is, is really in it. Um, so uh, this is what we, we spend a lot of, time on in interpretation say at the at the top levels with great orchestras like they can sight read anything and if they if anyone does make a mistake in the first run through by the time you've gone through it a second time it's all there um they know how to play together in most cases they've done the pieces hundreds of times or they've got traditions dating back decades um or more um, so, you know, they can play the music, but why we still rehearse, have five rehearsals uh, sometimes before concerts when it's a big main series thing. And it's this sort of thing of like, well, how do we, you know, what does it mean, the notes, right? And so, and what are the colors? What are the textures? How do you balance things? Um, because all of that isn't there in the notes, right? And so that's really where the, the work happens um, in making sure that each level of the textures in here, like, so now this will be an easier section in a way for balance because we've got so many unison things, but you're gonna have to go through and make sure that the intonation between each of these groups is okay and um, that they all agree on where these notes fit. Uh, I think I said this last time with the with the uh, ride session. Um, I've in adjudicating, and I'm sure you've all noticed this as well. But in adjudicating festivals and, and hearing tons of bands, it can be really impressive the level in a fast piece, and then they've got their their token slow piece, and then you see, oops, the uh, you know a lot of work to do on on tone and on intonation and on listening and and on phrasing. Um, so these are really important uh, things to be working on. Now, if, uh, okay, we've got this next section here. Is that, uh, I don't have the comments up or anything, but do, does that give you a pretty good sense of the first part of the piece? 
to move on to the next uh, bit here that we've got this this is the first time we're arriving up at a forte with this accent here i would make this pretty pretty dramatic um to really you know arrive there but it doesn't mean that we haven't sung out you know above mezzo forte at any point I, I think that as these melodies go we are singing in a in an expressive way i wouldn't uh, hold the dynamics back too much but forte um dynamics back too much in the melodies in the accompaniment yes restrain them uh but in the melodies let let people sing out but then this is the first time the composer really marks this well we need to make sure that structurally this is kind of a high point we've got this big moment of arrival and then the tempo is going to slow down and we want to make sure we have this contrast then with the pianos okay um so by really heading up here and then a, a fast enough diminuendo that this piano is going to come through clearly because if we play loudly but then don't diminuendo quick enough well we might lose this uh, entrance here of this little motif okay so um just something to you know when you're going through your score you go okay i i mark this thing like fast enough dim it's just through experience i know like well it's this could happen if they don't diminuendo fast enough this might get covered it might be totally fine and i don't have to say anything or indicate anything um and that's great but it's just a matter of when you're live in, in the situation seeing what uh uh what's going to happen okay um and then in terms of actual in this uh first section Again, for the conducting part of it, I think it generally the, the challenge is to be able to structure in your gestures the way the music is structured. Um, so that you're able to show the the first bar is leading through to the next bar, which is then leading through to the next bar and make sure that the you know that your gesture is going to indicate to them that we're going through to the fourth part. A fourth bar and a four bar phrase right and so that you um through size through through speed uh or just by having the left hand sustain things and to show that we're going to a point that's later than um you know where they currently are uh where the musicians currently are to get them thinking in terms of a line and thinking in terms of a destination and not to be thinking note by note at just where we are right at this moment Okay, so that uh, for for the technical side, the conducting side is, I think, kind of the main, uh, you know, one of the main things you want to be thinking about. Each of these musical things that I've talked about, well, then I would think about a way to show it physically. So if I'm going to ask a player, for example, here to do a bit of a crescendo, do extra crescendo, I'm going to make sure I've got a ton of eye contact. I'm going to be encouraging that now we will probably have to talk about it, but I'm going to show as much as I can physically and to show that we need to get all the way across the bar line to get over here and that we can resolve. Well, all of that, you just find a way to show the, the, where the resolution happens to show the breath here if they're going to breathe but to make sure that you phrase from here um, would mean that you're going to you're going to breathe on that third and then the fourth beat is going to lead us across the bar line now um in legato things we want to be going horizontal uh size you know all of these things considering it's tempting to get too big too soon um you know generally the smaller we are the clearer we are um, and if we want things to move forward in tempo for example it can be tempting to move faster and bigger but that actually you know can occupy more space which gives players kind of more time to play which actually you know can be counterproductive to trying to move forward so it's something that i read how the ensemble is reacting and if I'm trying to show energy and I'm giving more and I'm moving more, but it's actually not helping things move forward, well, then I'll make a mental note to actually move a little bit slower when there's less room between the beats. Musicians tend to, oh, I need to move forward because um, I don't have as much time and not as much space in between the beats. So then if I don't have the space, I still have to find a way to show the energy, okay, while staying small. 
Um, and that can be done, you know, a variety of ways. It can be with eye contact, with your, with your breath, with your general body language, um, and, uh, and sh through showing the line. Okay. I know it's, it's, it's weird to be speaking in a abstract sense about this, but, uh, with everyone here being conductors, I hope that's, that's helpful nonetheless. Um, okay. Continuing on with uh, the music side of things. This is another opportunity here for, we do now finally have some you know, little phrasing indication here. Um, I would, I've marked in a little bit of a resolution, a little bit of a genuendo and to sing through the third here. Um, it just makes it more beautiful. The, this is D flat and the berry is uh, in B flat. So they're both D flats. Okay, so. Re, fa, mi, mi, sol, fa. So the fact that we're going up a third, da, di, da. I would sing up D and let it resolve down to the E flat. I, Hmm. I didn't notice this when I was first studying it. Generally, when we've linked two notes with a slur, we wouldn't be connecting, right? We, we teach our students to, to kind of lift after the end of a slur. I, I don't find that particularly musical here. Da, di, da, to, to break between the fa and the mi, I, I don't really see that as being a good idea. Um, again, technically it'd be what's written. I don't know why he didn't just phrase it like this um, across, but uh, that's how I would do it is di, da, di. And then we have the bum, bum, bum. And then da, di, dum. And then di, da, di. So this kind of uh, thing going back and forth between the two uh, groups, right? Passing it between to make sure that there's a connection made there. And then with the three notes in a row, generally with three notes, we don't wanna play them all the same. Our options are we can do a crescendo through, we can do a diminuendo across, or we can do a hairpin uh, towards the middle. Okay, and uh, this is a matter of choice, what you think makes the most sense. Uh, musically. One of the recordings I listened to today, I when I analyzed it, I felt I, I sing each one. Honestly, I don't know right when I look at it, which one is going to be but I am looking for a way to make it uh, um, expressive. And so I would kind of sing a little bit towards the middle and, and resolve. Da, da, da. That's how I would do it. One of the recordings I listened to today did a crescendo da, 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 to the downbeat which is, you know, another option. Um, but uh, I just find with D, uh, da, di, dum, ba, da, dum, ba, di, dum. To me, the, the swell in the middle made the most sense, but it's not, it wouldn't be wrong either way. Um, and then when we get into, I just noticed the time. Um, I don't want to run uh, too far over here. Um, let me just see. You got over already. Okay, we got ten minutes away. Good. Um, in this section here, oh yeah, misprint. <laughs> There's these rallentandos. I don't know if that's in everybody's score. Rall with like no notes. Obviously, a, a, a misprint there. I think. Um, and I think it was meant to be part of this maybe, but I don't know. Um, I would just cross that out. That happens in all sorts of music, misprints. Um, so the printed word is not always final. <laughs> um, kind of have to make sense of, of what's there. Um, now, when we get into this bit here with the clarinets, I would really encourage, we've got this unison here and then we've got the um, third so how does this go here? We've got D, um, and then we've got the thirds going. Now, when you've got thirds, try to really have the lower note sing out a little bit to support the upper notes. 
okay so that to have when we it, it allows for more harmonics and it allows for better tuning and a little bit richer sound okay when on the piano i learned to do the opposite in order to get this to come out i would uh what note is this so the do i would play the the third is less and so that i would have this nice i don't know if you can hear this and they and through zoom i have no idea if the dynamics are being uh, leveled out or what um, but anyway the, I would bring out on the piano the do more and the and the a flat less but it would be a little bit the opposite when we're dealing with a, an ensemble um, we would want to make sure that the a flat is really supporting the sound and that the third is ringing nicely within the sound of that uh, lower a flat so that we've got a, a nice uh, singing tone rich tone through there um, and then that brings us uh, to this little conclusion. We've got this Valentando here. We resolve everything, another four, five, one cadence to finish our, our section here. So, um, you know, G flat, A flat, and then D flat. And we're back to the same material as the beginning. Um, now, when music repeats like this, there's a couple ways to do it. You could do it the same exactly as you did the first time, or it might be an opportunity to, you know, if you had slowed down more the first time, well, this might be an opportunity to, to keep going a little bit more and to, you know, to shed another light on the same material. Um, typically, I think we, you know, we gen tend to do it more or less the same way. Um, but I just wanted to say that it's not a must. You know, you could have a little bit more direction uh, this the second time through. Now, there's this kind of surprise chord change here. It goes into a flat six. So we're going in, we're in D flat major, and we end up with an A major chord. Um, so this is kind of a surprising moment harmonically here, uh, which is nice to bring out, which the composer does with these accents um, on the second beat. And uh, crescendo through here, heading us, we're just getting more drive going through as we head into this faster section. Now, four notes in a row, five notes in a row, when they're stepwise motion like this, the thing I'm always looking for, the curve. Where's the shape? So rather than just doing stiffly, da 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 dum, to where's the curve? Ya da 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 dum, so that it's got to swing through it. Ya da 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 dum. And I would really feel it between the, the E flat and the F. Okay, we're still are aiming towards the top, but this can still be shaped. It doesn't mean just one dynamic and all notes uh, equal. Which kind of helps to bring some momentum as well um, for this somewhat marcato, faster version of the theme. So the somewhat marcato, it's a bit more tongued. Uh, it is intentionally a bit more emphasized, a bit more note by note, which is okay if we've done a great job of making the other iterations of the theme more legato and longer line. Um, some really kind of interesting funky harmonies through here. I took the time to kind of go through and I was like, well, what are they actually? Because there's, there's some interesting clashes uh, in here. Like we've got a... Um, an E flat chord, this here at the start of this, we've actually, we're on a D flat, but it's an E flat chord. So it's the seventh that's on the bottom. Um, and we've also got an F in here. Uh, where is it here? Yeah, in, uh, where is the F? With the ninth, an E flat nine seven chord, anyway. Um, when I looked at this earlier, it made sense. Let me just see if I can find it. We've got our G flat Bs. Actually, while I'm doing this, it's a great opportunity to talk about when I'm tuning something, the order I always go in is to find what is the root of the chord, not necessarily the bottom note, but what would be the, you know, in a D flat chord to get all the D flats going and then to find the fifth and get the, the fifth tuned. So we've got the D flat tuned and the fifth tuned and get that open fifth in tune now with everybody and then you add the third into the middle afterwards once you've got the open fifth locked in then find the third and and just kind of place it in typically the third can be played a little bit less 
uh, less loudly. If you if you have a sustained chord, for example, at the end of a piece, which we will hear, and I could talk about it then, I suppose. But um, generally, the third is the color, and we can just uh, have it be a little bit softer, and it will it will balance nicely into the uh, the root and the fifth that are within the chord. Um, and that's something that we're doing all the time at the professional level as well, uh, because intonation is not an absolute. Different players will feel things higher or lower. And so one of the challenges in an orchestra rehearsal, uh, also different instruments have uh, tendencies, as you know. Um, but one of the things is to get everyone to agree on, uh, you know, what, what pitch are we using, uh, even at the professional level. So. Um, that's something that we definitely do spend time on. And um, actually, I had uh, I had coffee with uh, Charles Dutois a few months ago, and Dutois was the conductor that really put the Montreal Symphony on the international map and did like 90 recordings with them. And so many of them are still um, reference recordings today, you know, 25, 30 years later. And really extraordinary musician. And something that he was known for was fixing intonation by fixing balance. And so I asked him about this and he said, well, when players can hear themselves within the chord, then it's much easier to tune. And so by having, when I mentioned earlier, the third being a little bit less, that's something that if the third is blaring out there, everybody could be playing in tune, but it kind of throws the harmonics out of wonk and so out of whack. So I just putting that out there as a, a thought that sometimes just by working on the balance of a chord and making sure that the, you have the right levels of the root and the fifth, and then just adding a bit of the third in, you can end up fixing the intonation uh, without even having to, to raise or lower. Now, I know in the earlier levels, it's a lot of you know, control and just getting people to, to be able to tune and to listen. So it may not apply, but, uh, but I'm just putting that out there. Um, as a thought. And then as we get into kind of the more dramatic aspect of this piece, uh, this faster middle section, again, four notes in a row, five notes in a row. I'm always looking for the curve and generally the, the, the forces of the curve are towards the second note. Um, and a thought here I marked to tag this here, we've got an accent. And then we have a long sustained note. Whenever you've got this accent, long sustained note, accent, long sustained note. Well, there's a lot of other things happening, like the melody while this is going on. And so the accent is a tag. And then I would come away and allow space, be softer in here to make sure that we can hear the, the melody and what's going on. For sure, an accent does not mean, you know, attack and then keep playing loud all the way through. It means that the front of the note is attacked and then we can come away and leave space here for the, the other instruments to be heard. Okay. Um, a little moment for the percussion. They're not too busy in this piece, but this is one moment where they kind of help drive things across the bar line a little bit. Okay. Um, and uh, to broaden greatly this nice kind of opening thing. Now the, the composer writes in a forte, mezzo forte here, kind of a, he does a little bit of what I was encouraging earlier, come away in order to leave more room for the crescendo. Um, but in this case, it's a particular effect, go towards the downbeat and then come away. It's fairly obvious. I, I don't need to go into that. This is the same material as what we've already seen. Um, coming into the end here, great rallentando. Well, one of the dangers in Rallentandos is slowing down too soon and ending up with kind of no momentum left in order to naturally get to the end of the bar. So again, it says great Rallentando. Well, yes, that means we're going to slow down a lot, but I wouldn't slow down too much in the first two beats. I would start to subdivide when I'm conducting this. I would right away start to show the subdivision so that then we've got more room to start um, calculating. Everybody can feel, they know that it's in the subdivided. The way I mark that is with these, dung, 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 
dun, dun, right? So I just, and when I mark this and do a score, that's a visual thing for me. I know I'm going to be subdividing here, um, but I would definitely do most of the writ in the latter part of the bar. And one thing that is very beautiful here is this rising, uh, what is this here, rising seventh. While these instruments are kind of going a little bit more stepwise through here, we have the clarinets singing this nice big jump there. And so making sure that they can, that that nice little touch is heard. Okay. Um, and this gentle roll in the timpani, the timpani could do a bit of a swell here, just a just something that just gives us just a little brief moment of, of expression, something for them to kind of a touch of color there. And as I mentioned on these moments of stasis, a final chord, a great place to really make sure that um, that each degree of the the chord is individually tuned, but then to lock in the root. Uh, and the fifth, let me just see, is there even the fifth in this one? With these, uh, da, 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 this is, these are E flats. So yeah, there is the fifth here. Okay, so it, it looks like it's actually fairly naturally balanced with the number of D flats versus A flats in there, but that would be something to just kind of work on a little bit. Um, and it's a way to get a really nice soft sound uh, that rings and that is open. And I, okay, I wrote one last thing here, feel subdivision of 16th. Now, if we want to increase the likelihood of being really together, it can help to feel this as, instead of just eighth notes, D, da, da. You can go, you can have the players practice this as repeating each one. Da 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 d d d. Because by doubling it up, you can feel a more gradual progression of the rallentando. And then when they go back to playing it the way it's written, but still imagining that there's the repeated note in there, the repeated sixteenths, then they will feel more naturally together how the music slows down. So D D D D D D D D D D D D D D D D D And that's a little a little trick, adding a little extra subdivision in there. And I do use that at the professional level as well, just saying feel the inner subdivision and that way everybody can kind of feel the music together as we slow down. So that's it. I hope that that uh, is helpful for you. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I know we're a little bit past the hour. I don't want to hold anybody uh, up who needs to go. But if anyone has any questions or anything, I'm certainly happy to, to stick around and answer any. Um, or if there's anything I missed, uh, you know, don't hesitate to let me know and I can try to uh, help out. Um, I saw Mark Mark had a question about the timpani roll at 23 and 24. So if you want to scan back there and while you do that, I will just um, thank our sponsors, Cadme um, and Save the Music Foundation with um, for their support of, of Adam and this project, uh, getting him the scores and and uh, and providing us um, the the ability to 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 produce these segments with you. So uh, big thank you to Cadme and to save the music for for their support of this and thank you guys for coming and uh, being here tonight um, look forward to the next time we get to do this and uh, once again thanks to adam for uh taking the time to to analyze the score and go through it with uh with his orchestra eyes and and his band background as well and it's just it's really nice to hear uh such wonderful thoughts on on such great music so thank you very much to adam and thank you to everyone else and uh, Adam, if you want to talk to to um, Mark's question, then uh, feel free. Otherwise, sure. uh, thanks for being here, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And like I said, please feel free to go if you need to. Um, now, uh, the question, I don't have the chat up, so I didn't see 